everybody. Inshallah, everyone's doing well. Uh, my name is Omar Sharif. I will be your moderator uh, for this uh, session. This particular session is part of a long series uh, over the course of the convention, uh, hosted by the FYI, which is also known as the Family and Youth Institute. It's a mental health research and education institute that uh, strengthens and empowers individuals, uh, families, uh, parents, and promotes uh, youth development, uh, premarital and marital um, counseling uh, and development, and many other sessions related to uh, Muslim mental health and Muslim wellness uh, in general. So for this particular um, session, which will be focusing on uh, giving care to caregivers, I am very honored to be introducing uh, two of the head honchos for the organization. Uh, it doesn't get any bigger than these two, mashallah. I am honored to present our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Samira Ahmed. She has a PhD in clinical psych and has a private uh, practice in Canton, uh, Michigan. She teaches a variety of uh, universities across the nation. She's known for contributions in promoting Muslim mental health through her publication, Counseling Muslims, a Handbook of Mental Health Issues and Interventions, uh, most cited internationally uh, as the go-to academic book on Muslim mental health. If you want to learn more about the book that Dr. Samira has contributed towards, you can actually hit up the FYI booth, which is right outside over there where you can get more information about all of the publications, the toolkits, and all the research and development the FUI is working on. So Dr. Samira is a leading expert on American Muslim youth. She's uh, whose numerous groundbreaking publications including the state of the American Muslim youth, uplifting black Muslim youth, the prevalence of risk behaviors in U.S. Muslim college students, and alcohol use amongst U.S. Uh, Muslim college students. She serves as the associate editor for the Journal of Muslim Mental Health uh, and mentors up and coming Muslim mental health researchers. Uh, Dr. Samira has been invited as a subject matter expert by events organized by the White House, uh, the HHS Department of Health and Human Services, uh, SAMHSA, Substance Abuse uh, Mental Health Service Administration, and the DOE, Department of Education. And she's been cited in numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and The Atlantic. She is best known for her ability to transform research into practical resources tailored to the American Muslim community. Dr. Samira has been a community activist at both the grassroots and national level for over 30 years, serving as the Vice President for MSA National mm -hmm. sure. and as a board sure. member for uh, MASS. So, uh, mashallah, that was an incredibly long bio, which still does not speak to how much Dr. Samira has accomplished. She is joined by her husband, uh, Dr. Nadeem Siddiqui. Uh, Dr. Siddiqui is uh, the Chairman and the Board of Director. Uh, and the business manager for the FYI, and he is also a community educator. He holds a PhD in finance from York University and works in the area of st uh, strategy and analytics. In his professional career, Dr. Siddiqui has worked in financial services with clients across multiple industries as a management consultant, and he's taught BBA and MBA classes. Dr. Siddiqui is a trained marriage educator and has been a youth mentor and trainer for the MSA and MAS. He's been extensively involved in community organizing at both the local and national levels for over 25 years and has served as a national chairman uh, for Mass from uh, 2012 to 2016. So, mashallah, these are two very heavy hitters in our community, mashallah. And mashallah will be a beneficial session for you. Before we start the session, however, and get into like the meat and potatoes, if you guys look on the screen over here to my left, you'll notice that there are two QR codes, one uh, for you and one for parents. If you scan the QR code, it'll bring you towards one of the bigger projects at the FYI, uh, is engaging in, uh, and more information is actually right here on these little cards that you can get up on the top, and also uh, over at the booth. So the FYI has a research study on Muslim youth and character development, uh, which inshallah will be uh, touched upon in this session as well. And we encourage parents to sign up for their youth, and if you are a youth yourself, uh, between the ages of 13 and 20, we highly encourage you uh, to sign up. And if you know any youth that are not here in the room right now, but you think would be good candidates for the particular study, just share the link with them, or give them one of these cards. They can help participate uh, as well. So please uh, sign up by scanning the code. And once we change slides, if you want more information, come grab a card, or grab a card from the FYI booth right outside. Okay? So without further ado, I would like to introduce both our speakers, inshallah for our session on caring for caregivers. Jazakum khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khairan. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Wa ba'd. 
So we're, we're going to be talking today about elder care, looking after our elders and looking after ourselves so that we can look after our elders, inshallah. We start off by reminding ourselves as to why you're doing this. This is not a choice per se. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us very clearly to be dutiful to our parents. There are so many ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu emphasizing birr al-walidayn being dutiful, being good, and looking after your parents. When he's, when, you know, in different hadith, when he's asking which of the deeds are most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, looking after the parents. When the companion came and asked that, you know, I carried my mother on my back and did all of the hajj with her on my back, have I fulfilled my right to my mother? And the Prophet sallallahu said, you have returned her for one of the pangs that she felt in childbirth. That's just, just one thing, after carrying her on his back. So it tells you about the immense responsibility that we have to look after our parents. And by parents here, I mean elders. Could be uncles, could be aunts, grandparents, you by extension. These are all our elders, these are all our parents that we're looking after, inshallah. So it's clear that we want to do this. How do you do this in an effective fashion? Especially considering life in the United States, which is very different than life overseas. Life overseas, you may have the whole village around you to help, you have a whole system, you have a whole culture, you have a whole mindset of helping to look after elders. A lot of that doesn't exist here in North America. So how do we do that? Where we're balancing the rights of the elderly, but at the same time your personal family and the obligations you have. Because you can't ignore one over the other. Because one or the other will suffer if you don't balance appropriately. How do you work with your siblings? That are you the only one who's looking after your parents? What about the siblings? What rights? and responsibilities do they have? And so we'll address many of these topics, inshallah, through the course of the conversation today. So we start off by starting the conversation. You want to start the conversation of looking after your elders. And when I say start the conversation, I'm making an assumption here that the elders are independent living on their own first. Like for many of us, we grew up. So our elders, my parents emigrated to North America. Samira's parents emigrated to North America. They grew up, they looked after us, now they're older. We need to start having that conversation with them to see how we can best look after them. And sometimes that conversation is not easy. And it's not one conversation that you have, you just sit one time, let's talk it out, after an hour we agreed and we moved on. So I grew up in Toronto, that's where my parents had emigrated to. My parents were living in Toronto. My dad retired, was in his masjid for 25 years after retirement, was really happy. And then we started having that conversation. We were living in Detroit. It's like, you know, mom and dad, if you move down to Detroit, we can look after you better. It's unlikely I'll be moving back to Toronto anytime soon for various reasons. So we expressed that we want to help them. We want to look after them. It took us five years of conversations before my parents agreed to move down. So it's not an overnight thing. Conversation takes time. It'll take you many different approaches at times because they will have objections. I've been here 25 years, like after retirement, you know, my dad's got his schedule at the masjid, Dhuhr, Asar, Maghrib, Isha, that's his life. You know, after Dhuhr is the Samosa Halaqa, and then after Asr is the, he's got his set. You know, my mom's got her circles. Like, why would we want to move to a new place at this time in old age? Right? You have to work with them. And so it's a critical conversation, and it's a series of conversations you're having. And it's not you alone that will be having that conversation. You have to approach it as a team between the husband and wife. like, listen, you're not imposing on us. Both of us really want you come down. The siblings have to get involved. We'll talk more about the siblings. That yes, this would be good if you're living with one of us 
It's not good enough to be living five minutes away from us or 10 minutes in our situation. I mean, again, we'll talk about different circumstances. That it's not good enough to be living further away because something could happen. And how do you have all of these? And so there are different types of conversation starters you can have. Because a lot of people will come up and ask, how do I initiate the conversation? These are some examples. And I'll tell you up front, we're going to be flashing some screens. Literally, we might be flashing through. Uh, and you might think, oh, that's too much. Almost all the resources that we're talking about are online in our elder care toolkit. And that's why I'm comfortable. I'll share stuff. I may not refer to every single thing. But if you look at our toolkit online, you'll get all of these details. So you, you have to have those conversation starters. But before I go further, I wanted to get a poll. I was just sort of waiting for more people to come in so I could ask this question. By way of just raising your hands, how many people are right now actively looking after their elders? Just raise your hand. MashaAllah. How many people are expecting to look after your elders in the next, say, three to five years? MashaAllah. How many people are here because they're interested in a topic, you know, parents are still in the 50s or whatever, they don't expect to be looking after, but down the road at some point we'll be looking after the elders? MashaAllah, very good. Very happy to see people thinking forward. You know, when we were putting together a lot of the resources for elder care, we did the, these uh, listening sessions where we went to communities, we talked to the elders themselves, we said, you know, you have to be 65 plus to be in the room, everybody else has to leave. And then we had a separate session with the young folks who were looking after the elders. And you get very different conversations taking place and very different perspectives sometimes. We'll, we'll talk through more of this. But through the conversations, you're asking the elders to express their needs. Especially if you catch them early on. Don't wait until they're so old that, you know, dementia has set in. It's difficult for them to formulate thoughts as early as possible because you want to be respectful of what their needs are, what their wants are. How do you want to live your life? What do you want happen? I mean, end of life care. This is a great time to discuss rather than when they're in a critical situation in the hospital. And it's like, like my dad was very clear. I, we started having these conversations early on. My dad was, don't turn me into a vegetable. Something happens to me, don't put me on life support and extend my life for six months. So what? That six months is not worth it. If my time comes, you do what you can immediately, but if that hasn't happened, let me go. Don't put me on a machine and extend it for six. Like, you want to have critical conversations. And that's just, you know, at the end, but in the middle. What kind of life they want to live, how much independence, what are things they want to need. So you want to talk to them about that and understand what are the needs that the elders have. So, alhamdulillah, we, that's a process and I think there's a lot more details in the toolkit. But what I want to do is start, start, start thinking about, okay, what are some of the common challenges that we, you will encounter and kind of the issues and challenges that some of the elders will have. Again, the idea is if you're aware of that, you can anticipate it and you can plan for it as much as possible. Um, first of all, you know, generally speaking, there are going to be physical changes, physical changes that's going to impact their health, um, cognitive issues, things that you imagine your parents always used to do by themselves. Now, slowly, if you're not looking for those changes, you may not notice them, right? So, you know, mashallah, my father has, you know, traveled the country, traveled the world all by himself, no issues. But, you know, he's now 80-something, right? And so what we've been noticing over time, he is slowly getting overwhelmed. Um, other relatives also having some issues. And so if you're not paying attention to those things, you're not going to catch it. And so recognizing the need to, to pay attention to the physical changes, the psychological changes, the issues, that changes in the, in the brain matter where, you know, is being aware of what does Alzheimer's look like, what does dementia look like. Knowing what to look for will help you. We were able to help find, kind of help Nadim's mom get help earlier because we knew, okay, this is what these things look like. Okay, let's get the medication. Let's get the intervention. Let's make those changes. Had we not had that awareness, 
we wouldn't have been able to help them out. And so really being aware of, one, physically, what are the changes to be expected psychologically, socially. Because also remember, socially, you know, Nadim talked about moving his parents from Toronto to here. I had to do the same thing with my parents. When we're asking our parents to move, they're losing their social support network. They're going from a place in a community where people know them, respect them, value them, and you're asking them to come to a place where nobody values them, really. Right? That history isn't there. And so really having those conversations, really thinking about what that means. One of the things that I did with my parents is, look, come earlier so people can get to know you. People can understand who you are and support. So you have additional social support besides me. And that's really been very helpful. Also recognize that there are also different types of elders. Our, our parents are gonna respond to kind of aging differently. Some parents are gonna be independent, you know, and they will continue to be, being able to live independently. And you know, it's more of just checking in and socially, emotionally, making sure they're okay. Some parents are gonna be deniers. I have, you know, mashallah, we've got like 500 relatives, and 600 relatives in the U.S. So we have a lot of elders, and we see, get to see all the different elders and how they're responding. We have, you know, I have relatives who can barely walk, but they're like, I'm going to do it. I can be independent. Don't, don't, don't help me. But you're, you're making me old. You've got those parents. So you have to use a different psychology, a different, a, a different approach to working with them. You guys, you have those who are cognitively challenged. They're not realizing how they're slowly changing. Their brains are not able to, to handle a lot of the things that they used to. And then there are other elders who are recognizing, yeah, I'm old. I need help. I'm not able to do the things that I used to do. Can you help me and work with you? So the, recognize the different types, and you have to work with those elders differently. Actually, by a quick show of hands, knowing these sort of five types that we've listed here, uh, how many people think their elders are the independent type? Well, mashallah. How many people are, have elders that are deniers? I'm never getting old. Okay. How many people have the uh, overly controlling that even when they're with you, they have to do things their way? Wow. Okay. And cognitively challenged? Mashallah. And then... How many actually embrace their AIDS, recognize that they're getting old? Oh, wow. Is there a category that we missed? Is there somebody who is not in any of these? Independent would be the first one. Fully dependent. Okay, embrace their age. That's what we put it in, that they embrace that I need the help. Oh, Overly up. dependent. Overly dependent. Yeah. Mixed, yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Th these are not black and white categories. People go fall. I'm surprised by the, the, the lack of hands of how many embrace their age. Seems more on the other side, which is something for us to look at, inshallah. So, so as you're going through this, you, you need to identify their changing needs. Samir started mentioning, how do you notice that they need help? How do you know when to start those conversations? Like, you don't want, you want to impose something on them and so we have, again, in a toolkit, lots of different things that you can look at. And I, I, would, I, would, I would encourage you to look at the toolkit. You got some examples. You know, if your parent was a type, every single day the mail was opened up, looked at the bills, the pills were paid on time, and now you visit them, they're like, mail is piling up, the bills are overdue. Should be an indication, hey, something's going wrong. Things are slowing down. My, you know, your dad was a type whose light bulb goes off within that same day, the light bulb would be changed. Now three weeks in a row, you've come and visited, the same bulb has been fused, nobody's bothered changing. There are different indicators that you can use to tell you that yes, your parents are getting older without them having to say it, without you having to talk. But you need to be aware of these things. So what are those indicators? Again, you can go through the toolkit, there's a lot more. And then as you start thinking about looking after the elders, what are all the different areas you should be thinking about? Yes, there's housing. We talk about, we, we think about that immediately. Where are they going to live? Financial, of course. How are we going to manage their finances, their own finances, right? I know somebody who, whose parents were living on their own, independent, generally, they had not had the conversation with the parents. The dad had a stroke. May Allah cure him and give him health, inshallah. But because of that stroke, his mind became almost like a fifth grade level. He was running a fully independent business. The kids have no clue how to access all those things. 
So financials, who knows what? Where's, what's going on? What happens from the legal perspective? Are all the legal documents signed off? Not just the will, but organs, talking about uh, uh, the um, other, other legal things. I'm thinking about the DNRs, the, the do not resuscitate, power of attorneys, et cetera, healthcare, the social and emotional stuff that Samira talked about. All of those things have to be looked on. So as you're doing with all of this, you have to work with all of these things in mind. And you have to be tactful, you have to think about different approaches to think about them. My goal here is not to go through all of them, I'm simply raising them to say you have to look up and see what are all those issues. Go through the toolkit. I'm gonna come back to toolkit over and over again. There's just too much information, it would not be fair for me to list through all of that, but take your time to work through the toolkit and say, here are 201 questions I should be thinking of, here are all the issues I should be considering, I need to start early, I need to be patient, what's my strategy in dealing with all of this? As I'm, I'm doing all of this, let's spend some time thinking about us. How do we look after ourselves? Oh, is that me? Let's see what I can do with right. John. So oftentimes, we have, you know, when we talk about taking, taking care of our elders, we know we have, there, there is so much, um, so much reward in taking care of them, right? And we get to the point of sometimes romanticizing what that looks like without recognizing the care, caregiving stress that we experience and not taking care of ourselves. Well, I should be able to do it. I should be able to do it. I mean, push, 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 push. But recognize that caregiving burnout is real and has a real huge impact on your physical well-being. You start internalizing the stress because you're not taking care of it, your, yourself. You're not get, getting the doctors. You're having you know, all these different issues because that stress needs to go someplace. Right? And so it has an impact on family dynamics, your internal family, your marriage, your relationship with your children, your relationship with the siblings, all of that, we'll talk about that. You often, if, if the parents are living with you, lack of privacy issues, right? That would need to be addressed, which doesn't have impact in other areas. We talked about some of that yet, um, in the earlier session. In, in, sometimes, depending on the parents' health situation, kind of uh, sleep issues, you know, and there's so many different issues that has, it has an impact on you as a caregiver. And if you're constantly focused and, and not replenishing yourself, and not giving yourself time, some downtime to recover, you're going to burn out. And so you want to be there for your parents. But in order for you to be there, you also need to be healthy. And so recognizing that there is stress Acknowledge that stress and make sure you start working on kind of the self-care solutions. Again, everybody's situation is different depending on where you're, the health of your parents versus, you know, if they're healthy versus not healthy. But really just think about these issues. You know, how do you, are you able to pay attention to your body when it's stressed? Sometimes people can't tell. I mean, for us, I mean, I'm very obviously able to tell with my body and I could start seeing these changes, but I think that was something that Nadim really struggled with, being able to tell, okay, what's going on? How is the stress impacting me? It's impacting me. Well, these are the patterns that we're seeing. When we got our kind of a break, there was, you would see that he'd get sick. He'd sleep, he'd end up having to sleep a lot more and there's all this stuff that we couldn't figure out. And I was like, this is the stress coming back. Right? And so recognize that you need to avoid burnout. And so think about what are the things you can do for that. And there's a lot of different examples in the toolkit that talks about it, but really think about one thing I would say is if people offer help, take it. No, no shade on you. This is a marathon. This is not a sprint. Right? Secondly, even people don't offer Make sure you ask people for help. Whether it's family members, whether it's friends, whether it's a community, let people know that these needs exist and ask for help. So let's talk about some specific challenges. First thing is with working with siblings. That is, if you're not an only child, you have siblings. It is very, 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 very important to get the siblings involved up front early on. We often make the mistake of trying to be the Lone Ranger. That I am the Superman, the Superwoman, I will do everything by myself, and perhaps with good intention. I want the Ajar. 
I want the reward for looking after my parents. But as Samira mentioned, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. You will burn out. You will not be able to look after the parents. And in the middle of that marathon, you will feel negatively about your siblings. At that time, even though you said, I want to look after the parents, be like, how come they don't help out? How come this that happens? How come that? You don't want to be in that situation. So you want to minimize that conflict. And, and siblings are different. There are some siblings who are, I, I was talking to one of my elderly aunts just last week. She's in Texas, and she has, mashallah, 10 kids. And she was describing the two of the kids that she normally lives with, between here and Pakistan. She bounces back and forth. So when I'm in Pakistan, I'm with that son. When I'm here in, in the United States, I stay with this son. And she recognizes each child differently. She's like, my oldest son, he loves me. He will shower with me with money. I don't spend a night at his house. Because that's not the type of support he gives. He's just not the emotional type. This other son, he will just take time off from work. He'll sit with me, talk with me all day because he's emotionally connected to me and so forth. So recognizing that each sibling can play different roles. We don't all have to play the same role, but what are those roles? And who we are and how we do this is really important. So another thing, so one of the things that's really important for anybody who's taking care of elders and have siblings is to make sure you get all the siblings on the same page. Because some of us, and most, of, most likely the people who are in this room, are keenly aware that our parents are getting older. And so you're naturally inclined to be seeing these things, right? But the others may still think of their, your parents as if they were 40, and they can still do everything and no issues. Because it, remember, we, all of our memory is when our parents were younger, right? And so we don't see them as people who are getting older, we often tend to see them at that stage where they were taking care of us, and so we're used to always going to them for help. So it's a flip of a, re a reversal. So part, it's really important that, one, you start educating your siblings, and say, let's have regular meetings. And as you do that, keeping everybody up to date on their health and well-being. And for those of you who are elders in the room, if your kids are not able to do it, you start it because you are often in a better position to start this process for the kids and letting them know like, hey, this is what's going on in my health, this is where things are, I need someone to take care of this, someone to take care of that, and start dividing up. Most of our elders haven't done that, so I'm just telling you as siblings to make sure you start doing the process. And so it could be you identify what your strengths are. Okay, my strength is legal, I'll take care of the legal, I'll take the medical, and divide it up with that. But have some type of division. Because like Nadeem said, you may be doing it because you want the ajr. And that's great and wonderful. However, if that builds into anger resentment, you're not gonna be working as a team looking after the elders and that's going to be much harder. So really make sure to do that. The other thing I would say is also for us to recognize biological children have a responsibility above the in-law children, right? And particularly in some cultures, and I'm very familiar with South Asian culture, so I can talk about that, oftentimes the daughter-in-law is expected to do things even more than her biological, their biological children which Islamically is not appropriate. Like, you do it as an in-law out of love and respect and you get their ajar. But the responsibility comes for the biological kids. And so that's really important for us to recognize and understand and make sure the biological children, the siblings, are first in responsibilities. I'll emphasize that, especially in South Asian households. You know, the son is like, yep, parents are gonna live with me. Great, get what? The wife, the daughter-in-law, the whole burden's on you. It's like you signed up, but you're passing it on all the responsibility. That's not how it works. And the parents need to recognize that, that just because he's your son doesn't mean he's off the hook. He's the one who's responsible because she's responsible for her parents. For each child is responsible for their parent, not necessarily the in-law. So it's very important for us to do that. All right, some, what are some of the family challenges that we will encounter. As you're going through this, you will encounter some marital stress. Because you are looking after elders, it takes time, 
there's pressure, there's perhaps conflict coming in from the sibling side that flows in, hey, you need to talk to your brother, he needs to do more of this, your sister needs to do more of this, how come they're not doing this? And that flows into your marriage. And then that causes marital stress. You'll have parenting challenges. Sometimes the children don't always appreciate the fact that the grandparents are living with them. Perhaps the older ones might appreciate, oh, you know, this is a great time to connect with the grandparents. And then the other kids will be like, why are they always with us? How come to our family time? I can't relax with them because my grandma or grandpa, they're always like, nope, that's an inappropriate show. You can't be watching that. You have to dress like this. You have to do this. You have to sit like that. You're, you're slouching. It's like, I can't relax in the house. So the grandchildren then start resenting having grandparents around. So you have to think through, how do you manage that process? For yourself, if you're working and you're looking after the parents, well, the parents are fully retired, they're at home. They want somebody to be around them all the time. But you're working, perhaps the spouse is also working, and so during the day, nobody's around. As soon as you get home, the parents are waiting. It's like, oh, finally home, I wanna talk to you. And you're like, I need some downtime. Well, there's no downtime. So work issues might get impacted. And then Samir already mentioned the social isolation that could come about. So these are some challenges that you need to actively think about and then plan for. And I just want to say a little bit more about the social isolation because you don't really think about it. Oftentimes what happens is, this is all like specifically like if the parents are living with you. Not everybody's situation is like that, right? But sometimes when the parents are living with you, or even if they're not, they're, you're spending all of your time, if you're working, and then going you know, to look after their ki the par your parents and then your kids, when do you have time for the community? You know, I live in Canton, Michigan, but those people who live in Canton, Michigan are like, do you still live here? Right? And it, that's the reality. I'm not able to get to the masjid, all the masjid activities and social activities. I'm not able to hang out with friends because I'm helping you know, the elders, right? And I'm trying to spend time with them. And so recognizing that social isolation happens. And so if you have friends who are in that situation, make sure you try to figure out ways of supporting them. As a community, make sure to have programs to help support because sometimes there are times where I couldn't get to the masjid and my, my mother needed to be at the masjid but I was like, okay, how are you gonna do this by yourself? Like, is, is there somebody to support you? And then my friends, alhamdulillah, would come out and say, don't worry, I got your mom. And so that support system helps the elders, helps us as well. So recognize that. Um, in terms of family connections, given the fact that there is that stress, really make sure to invest in some alone time as a family, as a nuclear family. And I know this is a very foreign concept, because for many people coming from collectivist society, you know, it's all one family. But realize you need to invest time and energy with your spouse. Time to talk, time to discuss, time to have some positive experiences and energies and memories. You need to do that. And you also need to do that with your kids. Now, some of the ways you could do it is if your parents are, are living with you, can you share time with a, another, another sibling? Is that a possibility? Are you able to ha connect them with other friends within the community? Is that where they can go out and have an elders gathering? And when they're having the elders gathering, then you're also spending time with your family. Are you able to you know, connect them on the phone, on, uh, or on fa do FaceTime with family members, where that you can use that time to, send, to come up with ideas and do activities with your family? You, you, but you need to be intentional. That's the key thing. How are we gonna spend Together as a family, how are we gonna spend time so that we can build that? Because if you don't, for those of you who attended the last session, we talked about the disconnection that develops over time. And the less time you invest in it, more disconnection and disruption happens. So really address those things and try to create positive associations with your kids and your grandkids, your spouse and your grandkids, all the positive things that your parents may say about your spouse, about your kids, so that the they, they, they feel connected. So you have to be very intentional about this. Inshallah, it becomes a very positive experience. So as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna jet through a whole lot of things. You may not have had a chance to look at all the notes, but I promise you everything that we shared is in the Elder Care Toolkit. So the QR code is up there. You can go to the website, search for the Elder Care Toolkit. It has that and a lot more. Our intention today was to introduce you to some of the concepts, to start the thinking process, and then introduce you to the resources that are available so you can utilize them. 
And again, it took me five years to convince my parents to move. It took you, what, a couple of years to convince her parents. So it, it's not a one-time thing. You have to start thinking and planning for it appropriately, inshallah. I know our time is up, uh, so we'll open it up for Q&A, inshallah. If you want to stay in touch with the FYI, sign up for our email list, inshallah, as new resources come about. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know about it. You can scan the QR code and inshallah join uh, the email list. Okay, so I just want to say jazakallah to both uh, Dr. Nadim and Dr. Samira. Uh, so for Q&A, uh, you can use your app to submit questions electronically. I think some people in the audience have already uh, done that. If you are comfortable raising your hand and speaking out loud, you can do that too. If you feel that your question is something more sensitive, you do have index cards that are available that you can write your questions on and pass them up front uh, for that. So right now it is 3.40. We're gonna dedicate maybe about 15, 20 minutes, inshallah, for Q&A, and then conclude with a hard stop at 4 p.m., inshallah. If your question goes unanswered. Hmm? Central time zone. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like New York time, you know? uh, hard stop at 3 p.m. Uh, inshallah, so we're going to spend the next 20 minutes uh, on QA. If your question goes unanswered or if your question is not addressed and you still want to speak to both speakers, it will be available afterwards, inshallah, or you can go to the FYI booth and the entire team is there to help field uh, any further questions or direct you to any resources that may be available for you, inshallah. Uh, so we'll start with the questions that have been submitted. Uh, online, and that'll be a free for all for the two of you to decide who would like to take it. Uh, so, the first question uh, that's submitted is How do we address taking care of elders with severe mental health issues, which make them unwilling to accept help or better their situation? Okay. I'll start, inshallah. Um, if you can get to the elders before they have the severe mental health development, it'll be better. So my parents have been living with us for the past, what, six, seven years. My mother has Lewy body dementia, uh, and that was diagnosed about six years ago or so. Uh, Lewy body dementia is your regular dementia plus Alzheimer's plus Parkinson's plus, plus, plus. So because of Parkinson's, your muscles are stiffening, they're hardening, uh, so she can't walk anymore, you know, your muscles are not functioning. The Alzheimer's, she's forgetting. Because of regular dementia, there's a lot of cognitive decline. Lewy body particularly, it's not just forgetfulness. Uh, her brain cells are not functioning as well, so uh, there's hallucination, visual hallucination, auditory hallucination. So please have a seat. I can't because somebody's sitting there. It's an empty chair, but she's hallucinating. You come down in the morning, she's like, she's sitting up. She's like, why are you sitting up? It's like, this guy came in, he sat at the foot of the bed, he was there all night. Just before you came down, he left the house. So she's hallucinating. She hears things like, I hear a kid crying next door. I hear a kid crying, go take care of the kid. There is no kid in the house, right? So the mental health challenges become immense. And, and it becomes really challenging on you to look after them. And this is where having a team really helps. One, you want to diagnose that mental health condition so you can get appropriate help. In our case, alhamdulillah, Samira was there. She recognized early on, it's like, hey, something's off. So we went, we, we, we were able to diagnose that this is Louis body, but at that time it was very rare. But it's like, this is effectively Louis body. And so we started getting, and, and you can't cure it, you can simply slow it down. We started getting some treatment for that. And similarly, if you can figure out what type of mental health issue it is, you can try to address some of this. But no matter what, some of these are gonna be persistent, some of them are terminal, there's no way to stop them. So then, how do you address it? Again, don't do it alone. Try to get a team, and then come up with a process around, you may have to change the way things are done at home. You may have to change the way you interact. But you have to put on those uh, solutions around it to help address that issue, inshallah. Just wanted to add a couple more things to that. So Nadim talked about um, kind of dealing with with, with, their, with with this, but I also wanted to also specifically say, you know, you can one for yourself as you if you know, notice certain things are off, talk to talk to their doctor. If you're taking them to the doctor's office, talk to your physician, you know, and ask people like, okay, these are the symptoms that I'm noticing that seem off. Is this something I should be worried about? Right. And so talking to physician might help because many of our cultures. 
mental health is still stigmatized. And so we need to shift that because, you know, subhanAllah, if you look at our history, we were the forefront in mental, the field of mental health, right? So that's an educational issue that we need to work on our community, but- We meaning for, the Muslims. We meaning the Muslims, um, which means all of you. Uh, <laughs> so, but the thing is, use the, med, the, uh, the physicians to help you in that process to help, maybe they're okay at least starting out with the medication for anxiety, because what you see oftentimes in the elderly population is increase in isolation, in, increase, in, increase in depression, anxiety, um, and it could be physical, it could be social years of you know, different ex things have happened. At least start with medication. And then secondly, for you to educate yourself about what does anxiety and depression look like in elders, because it's very different than what we also oftentimes think of. And educate yourself and start looking at what are the things that you can do. Now, if they refuse to get mental health, help with a psychologist. Find working, you work with a psychologist and see, okay, what can I do to help my parents? Because they can help fine, to, fine tune it with you. So if they're not willing, okay, what can you do? And that's fine too. And so if you, for those of you who aren't familiar, we, you know, many of us don't know what the therapy looks like, what the process is. We do have resources on how to find a good therapist that may be helpful to you on, online. Uh, next question. How can we help elders who are emotionally manipulative? <laughs> so, uh, I think part of it is with manipulation, if, first you gotta name it to tame it, right? If you're able to name it, and you know, obviously you wanna make sure it's it's your, your nafs is not involved, and sometimes people say things, do things that we feel manipulated, but may not be manipulation. So you wanna make sure it's not just you. Once you do that, then you wanna understand what exactly is happening, what are the patterns of manipulation, are there certain topics? So oftentimes what will happen, and again, stereotypical, it's not like this is always the case, but I, again, I hear a lot in the South Asian community, or also you know, in, in the Arab community as well, where the mother may emotionally manipulate the son, you don't love me, I birthed you, I did all this for you, I sacrificed, da 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 da, da and it goes on. And then the wife is like, what about me, right? And so that is a situation, and so many times a wife will feel manipulated because the husband is not able to manage his roles and responsibilities properly. And so when the, when the son kind of runs away from the issue, that's when the wife is also feeling manipulated over and over and over again. And so that's when the man needs to be a man, right? And really say, like, you have rights and responsibility, mom, and I will give you everything and everything that I can. But my wife and her family, and, and my family, also has rights and responsibility, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gonna ask me about her as well. And if, the son is not able to do this properly. That's where you're going to have a lot of issues. Um, marital stress, parenting stress. The children are going to revolt and react and rebel and be very angry and resentful to their grandparents. But we don't want any of that stuff. And a lot of times it's just the parents just missing their kids. So one thing I'll just add on this is that from an Islamic perspective, Sometimes parents are like, no, I have absolute control over my children. You have to look after me. You have to do as I say. And scholars have clarified this, that our duty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words in the Quran are very precise. Our duty is to look after our parents. Our duty is to make sure that they are taken care of. But our duty is not to ignore all the other rights of everybody. So sometimes parents will demand things that are not right. You will make sure they're taken care of. Imagine an extreme example, an extreme example. Your parents are non-Muslim. You converted. You still have those exact same duties. You have to look after the parents. Except when they tell you to do something that is un-Islamic, right? So that's an easy example to understand. When your parents are Muslim, sometimes we forget that our parents could also be asking us to do things that are un-Islamic because they don't understand what is Islamic, what is not. They're coming from a cultural perspective. This is what everybody did, and therefore this is my right. And it might be challenging, but you have to recognize that what is being asked at this point is un-Islamic. You're going beyond the rights of parents. The children also have rights. The spouse have rights. Other people have rights. 
So don't get manipulated from an Islamic perspective. Talk to the shiuch. They'll help clarify some of this because sometimes they were like, I don't have a choice. I have to do this. It's, no, even from an Islamic perspective, be careful about that, inshallah. Okay, so the next question, there's multiple questions that are coming in about this topic, so I'll combine it uh, together, which is, what are the special considerations for taking care of elder parents who are divorced or separated? Yeah. That's a really good question, um, and it's something, these are all, that's why I love these questions, because the realities of our community is, it, we're able to kind of start, think through, right? And so, this is where, again, team approach is really important um, because, you know, both parents have a right and responsibility to be taken care of. And can you get other people, like your siblings, to help out and figure out what are the different ways? Because it's not like one parent gets more than the other or like that. One thing they also keep in mind that sometimes, um, I remember a situation that someone, someone shared was, do I have a responsibility to my parents? Or what type of responsibility do I have to my parents who have been abusive? Right? And that's a challenge because recognize they violated a right on you. And if you're able to do, may Allah reward you, give you the ajr and reward. But if they continue to abuse you, the hadith says there's no harm and no harming, right? Nadarar wa nadarar, right? And so you are not to put yourself in constant harm, right? Now you can think, okay, what are their needs? How can I help? They need groceries? Okay, maybe I can help them with the groceries, but don't expose yourself to toxicity. Don't expose yourself to kind of that, that aspect unnecessarily. Don't harm yourself. And I, sorry, I took a tangent on that. But that was one thing I just wanted to remember. But also, but just going back to divorce situation um, and blended families, to, to really make sure that you do the best that you can. Allah's watching you. Use the people, use your siblings and take a team approach. Um, and again, do the best you can. Allah's part of those help, trying to help you out. That last point is what I was going to uh, Be as balanced as you can and express it. Mom and dad, I love you both. I have a responsibility to lack, look after both of you. I'll come Eid al-Fitr, spend with you. Eid al-Adha, I'll come spend with you. Be very open, upfront about it, that this is how I'm balancing. So that you're not hearing back after as well, you didn't come for Eid. No, listen, I have to go for both. You're in two different cities now. I can't be in two places physically at the same time. So this is my methodology for being balanced. I'll come here one weekend. I'll come here the next weekend. That's how I'm being balanced. Don't pit me against the other. So you're being very open and transparent in doing this. And if you have siblings, it might be difficult, but now's the time to have a team approach. Hey, you go to mom, I'll go to dad, and then we flip. So that way no one is alone at any point in time. We always do things together. And depending on what it is, but leverage the resources that you have, the friends, the family, to make sure, because it's a challenging situation. It's not when the parents are together. Now you have two physically different places that you have to support, so it's gonna be taxing. Be mindful of that and try to be as balanced as possible without losing yourself in it. One other thing I was gonna say is also don't get into the marital conflict, right? Sometimes it's very easy to the parents, again, for whatever reason, because of the issues they may have, they may draw in their children into their conflict. When you see it happening, Name it and be like, look, I see, I understand that you're doing this. I'm not going to be a part of it. Whatever happened between the two of you, two of you, I still have a responsibility to both parents. And I'm going to fulfill it, and I'm going to do the best that I can. Okay. Next question is, how do I recognize caregiver fatigue or caregiver burnout in myself or my spouse when taking care of an elder parent? Okay. Um, so part of it is notice your body. Do you notice that you're getting stressed more, like physically your muscles are tight? Do you notice that you're becoming more irritable? Do you notice you're sleeping more or sleeping less? Do you notice you're having more physical issues? Um, you know, are you eating more, eating less? Because sometimes we, we eat more because we're stressed or sometimes we just don't eat at all. Um, for women, oftentimes your menstrual cycle also gets impacted by the stress. 
for, you know, recognize you may have difficulties concentrating in general. Uh, people, difficulties concentrating, difficulties kind of thinking through and processing things. These are all symptoms of stress. Think about how we're also talking to our kids if we have kids present. Are we yelling at them more? Is the quality of our relationship do, 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 do? Are we like a machine gun, right? Because, and that's also telling you that you're so super stressed, you can't even have a moment to sit and be with your kids and build the relationship. That's another way of telling that you are stressed and overwhelmed. Sometimes we just don't know, and so we really need to have the people around us tell us, like, hey, like, Things, you're not okay. You need help. Let's talk about it. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's really important. That's why we, like in the toolkit, we identify what does stress look like and then how to get help. So if you see any of those symptoms, then you know you need to do it. Okay. Uh, and we have a few more minutes left, so I'm just take a couple more. Um, what are the special considerations to keep in mind for caring for elders that are in another country than the one I'm living in. Mm. So elder care abroad. SubhanAllah, that's a tough situation in the sense that emotionally it's taxing on you. You care about your parents, but you're physically not there. Uh, it could be because you're just not able to travel. I mean, I talked to a couple of brothers. My father passed away about three months ago and we were talking to each other. It's like, yeah, my mom passed away and He's not allowed to return because he's politically active in the United States against the corrupt government over there. He can't go home. So he had to watch the funeral FaceTime, right? Extremely taxing. So that's an extreme situation. But sometimes, he, he, I mean, he couldn't go for, for many years. He couldn't. Um, so when, when your parents are abroad, first, who's looking after them? Try to make sure there's a sibling or there's a family member or somebody out overseas who is able to look after them. And then you do what you can in terms of you contributing from a financial perspective to look after them. And then also, now SubhanAllah, especially after COVID, everybody on the planet knows how to use Zoom, FaceTime, video calls are very common. Call them. You know how much an effect a simple call has? Sometimes we don't give it the due that it's needed. That parents just want to listen to your voice. They just want to see your face. They just want to have a chat with you. And we are so busy. We convince ourselves we're so busy. Anything at work, you know, if you got a calendar and the schedule, so many meetings, can you schedule five minutes? It has, it, I mean, even if it's a daily call, if it's a daily call, it can literally be five, ten minutes. If it's once a week, it can be longer. But you can schedule it in so you don't forget. According to the time difference, etc. it's like, all right, at noon, my lunchtime will start off with ten minutes of a phone call to my parent abroad because that's a great time for them overseas. But you, you schedule it, they feel the love even though you're not able to be there. And you ask them how, how are things, what can you do? You ask their caregivers what's going on with them. So to the best of your ability, you are trying to be there for them emotionally, financially, as well as in other ways so that they are uh, able to look after themselves. I guess we have to end. Sorry, did you want to add? or? Uh, thanks for the great for your lecture. This puts a uh, position, maybe this question about the non Islamic thing, which is do not resuscitate in the hospice care for elderly I mean, I, I hate to put you in the spot of that, like a fetal, but I tell people, yeah, go for it. But a lot of people say there's non Islamic thing. Okay. So, so, DNRs do not resuscitate. Uh, is a legal document that you sign, because in the United States everything has to be documented, right? That tells the doctors uh, or, or the emergency medical technicians that if something happens to me, do not try to resuscitate and bring me back. If you do not have a signed ENR, if the ambulance comes to your house, they are legally obliged to try and resuscitate you. One of the, uh, uh, one of the EMTs told me for 30 minutes. In Michigan, you're required to keep trying for 30 minutes, and if you do not come back, at that point, they can let you go. If you don't want them to touch you, you have to show that DNR. And he's like, unless you have that signed DNR when I come to your house, I'm gonna push you aside, and I'm gonna start doing CPR, whatever it is, for 30 minutes, because otherwise, I am legally on the hook. There's nothing wrong from an Islamic perspective. My father was very clear up front. He signed that DNR when he was well, he had Alzheimer's too, and cancer, and. Uh, he passed away, like I mentioned, three months ago. But 
six years ago, he said, give me that DNR. Scholars are like, listen, there's no Islamic requirement that you need to be resuscitated artificially for a long time. If something happens in the old days, you'll try to re revive you, but if something is going, then khair, let them go. It's time has come. Why do you turn them into a vegetable? Hospice care. My parents were in hospice care. My mom is in hospice care right now. Hospice care simply means the doctor, your regular medical physicians have said, you are at this point where in the next six months, our expectation is you will pass away. <coughs> so at this point, we're not going to try and cure you. So your focus changes from trying to cure you to giving you rest and comfort. That's what hospice care means, right? We are going to try and make sure the quality of your life is good. So we'll give you medication that will ease the pain as opposed to trying to cure you, right? And so the, the focus changes, sometimes the doctors will change, etc. Again, nothing wrong with that. You can talk to scholars about it. I mean, I discussed with some scholars that like, this is totally fine. Nobody said that. In fact, sometimes it's the opposite. It is wrong sometimes to try that you are at the end of cancer, you are at the end of your terminal life and you're using so much resources from the hospital, from the community to do what? to extend life for three months. Those exact same resources could have been used for somebody else, could have saved a life for another 10, 20 years. Right? So we have to be mindful of that and not be so selfish. So I think from Islamic perspective, you can talk to scholars, but it's generally okay, inshallah. The other thing is to, <coughs> to think about the quality of life of the elder. Right? What type of quality, what is the pain level that they have to go through if they were to continue? 